get ready for some bullshit, because I've got some YouTube audio clips of Deepak Chopra talking about consciousness. I want to make it clear from the start that I do not agree with Chopra at all, and I am only presenting these clips under fair use so I can properly take it apart and criticize it. Deepak has a YouTube channel. The link will be in the sidebar soon. You're separating the brain and the mind. Yes, the, the, the mind, that consciousness, the one I'm talking to right now, is not a product of the brain, but is localizing itself through the brain. Just like people who are seeing us right now on their screens, you know, we are not in their television boxes. We are coming through these airwaves and they are perceiving us, but if they open the box, they won't find Deepak or Jeff or anyone there. What Deepak is proposing is none other than the old the brain is a radio receiver theory of the mind and consciousness. That theory is as old as radio itself, and it was dead in the water when it was born. By dead in the water, I mean it has never led to one iota of understanding of how the brain works. It is a theory that has gone nowhere for over a hundred years. However, it does point to a flaw in my choice of metaphors in the first part of my series when I talked about proving souls do not exist by building an android. It now occurs to me that if the radio receiver theory were true, there might be another way to build an android. Instead of something akin to a computer as a brain, it would have something akin to a radio receiver as its brain. So when I say building an android like data will prove there is no soul, and that Deepak Chopra is dead wrong, I am assuming that this will be an android built according to some neural computation theory of the mind, not an android built on a radio receiver theory of the mind. In order for that proof to stand, you have to believe the guys who made the android knew which theory they were using and didn't make a radio receiver by accident. So the liars who want to bamboozle you with their soul talk, they will be able to get away with it if you don't understand the theories today's robot makers are using. I can assure you that all attempts to build humanoid robots going on today are based on computational information processing theories. There is no radio receiver theory of the mind in use by robot makers anywhere today. Scientists have until recently believed that, you know, just like your gallbladder secretes bile and your pancreas secretes pancreatic juice, your brain secretes imagination. That has got to be the most ignorant straw man explanation of modern theories of the mind that I have ever heard. Let's take a look at what a modern theory of the mind is really like. Over two decades ago, I came across Marvin Minsky's book, The Society of Mind. That book outlined a theory about how minds, both natural and artificial, might work that completely changed my outlook on what it meant to have a mind. Minsky sees human minds as a vast collection of semi-autonomous agents. These agents are intricately connected, and by themselves they are as mindless as small computer programs. However, working together, like a society, they produce mind, and unlike a computer, these agents do their work in parallel processes. What we call intelligence and consciousness, it emerges from the interconnections of these agents. The other related book that I wanted to talk about is Oliver Sacks' The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. It's a book about brain damage. And it is by looking at the results of brain damage that we can see the truth of Minsky's theory. Those cases of brain damage that don't kill people or turn them into complete vegetables, they reveal that our minds must be made up of something akin to semi-autonomous modules because they usually take out some, but not all, mental functioning. 
That means many of our mental agents can work somewhat autonomously and are not completely dependent on the function of other modules. All of Dr. Sack's patients fall into that category. The man who mistook his wife for a hat is the first story in Oliver Sack's book of the same name. It's the story of Dr. P, a distinguished musician, a singer, and a teacher at a noted musical conservatory. Dr. P began to develop some strange problems. Sometimes he could not recognize his students, or rather, not recognize the student until they spoke. The problem got worse, causing embarrassment, perplexity, fear, and sometimes comedy. Dr. P also began to see faces where there were no faces to see. He would sometimes pat the heads of fire hydrants and parking meters, thinking they were the heads of children. He would talk to furniture and be astonished when the furniture did not reply. The mistakes were so ludicrous and ingenious that at first everyone, including Dr. P himself, just laughed it off. Dr. P had always had a quirky sense of humor, and the rest of his mental faculties seemed to be intact. Yet, eventually, people noticed Dr. P had a real problem, and he was referred to Dr. Oliver Sacks. Thus began a short neurological detective story as Dr. Sacks searched for the clues to Dr. P's condition. Dr. P could talk fluently with imagination and humor, and there was no trace of dementia in any ordinary sense, but Dr. Sacks noticed something odd in P's gaze. Instead of looking at him, P would have sudden strange fixations on Dr. Sack's nose, ear, or chin, as if studying these individual features, yet not seeing Dr. Sack's whole face. So, Dr. Sack's began to perform some vision tests on Dr. P, and what Dr. Sack's discovered horrified even this very experienced neurologist. What Dr. P had lost, I will describe in detail in part four of this series. However, I will tell you this much. Dr. P had lost a very important part of the machinery of consciousness, and Dr. P didn't even know it. For those of you who can't wait to find out you can find Dr. P's story online at Google Books. I will have a link in the sidebar soon. The book again is The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat.